Well, welcome to everybody attending today's webinar from regions all over the world. And thank you to Anvision for putting on such a well-organized and informative event. I know that I'm really excited about today's presentation. I'm absolutely honored to be a part of it. My name is Kathy Good, um, and I'll be the moderator for today's seminar, which is titled Feline Infectious Keratitis and Conjunctivitis, the wide variety of ocular diseases caused by feline herpes virus and chlamydia felis. And I'm even more delighted to be able to introduce today's speaker, Dr. David Maggs, who's not only one of the best veterinary ophthalmologists around and a colleague of mine at UC Davis, but also a very good friend. Dr. Maggs is a graduate of the University of Melbourne. Directly after graduation, he spent five years in mixed animal practice throughout Australia, England, Scotland, and Wales. He then made his way to the United States and completed both small animal and equine internships at Colorado State University a research fellowship and ophthalmology residency at the University of Missouri, and then ultimately joined the faculty at the University of California, Davis in the year 2000, where he's been ever since. In addition to authoring numerous book chapters and research articles, he's one of the main authors of the highly regarded Slatter's Fundamentals of Veterinary Ophthalmology, which is now in its sixth edition. And I'm sure lots of you refer to that frequently, I'm sure. Dr. Mags's major interest is ocular surface disease and especially feline herpes virus for which he's truly regarded as one of the world's experts in this area of veterinary ophthalmology. So again, I'm thrilled to be here today to hear him speak. And on that note, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Mags. Well, thank you, Kathy. That's really, really nice of you and, and uh, what a lovely introduction. And welcome to everybody all around the, all around the world. Um, We've got, a, a, I think, a treat for you today, something that I know you see all around the world. And, and I just want to start by saying I, I hope everyone is uh, feeling safe. Uh, I hope that uh, your turn will come soon for the vaccine and, uh, and that soon we'll be able to all get together again. Because uh, for those who like going around the world and doing these um, lectures, this has been a there's been a tough year and, and I understand that that's uh, a small problem on a world scale, but I do miss getting together with everybody. And I do want to thank Anvision who've really done an amazing job to keep these webinars uh, or to start these webinars. They, as you know, have done labs and courses like this around the world in a pre-pandemic world. And now we're getting to, um, uh, they've adapted, they've pivoted and, any company that you know devotes a, um, a large proportion of their efforts towards corneal and ocular surface health is is near and dear to my heart. And I've known Ingeborg and Joyce and way back from before Anvision times. And it's just uh, really lovely to be here today and to be able to talk, talk to you about something that I know you see a lot. And and thank you very much, Joyce. Thank you very much, Ingeborg, for for getting everyone together today. And I, I know that you all see a, a lot of cats with ocular surface disease. Um, you know, it might be, might be this cat here, the young kitten with the upper respiratory disease, the bilateral conjunctivitis. It might be the, the older cat we see here who has a, a non-ulcerative um, stromal, sort of insidious stromal keratitis, some antigen residing in the corneal stroma just drawing inflammation out uh, in a, a slow and insidious and, and very hard to resolve or manner. Uh, it could be that cat with some degree of conjunctivitis. Here we see a massive chemosis and hyperemia, but it could be that chronic grumbling conjunctivitis. The cat with sequestrum here or the eosinophilic keratitis. Just a whole variety of cat ocular surface diseases. And that's what we're going to sort of focus on today. The, the infectious nature of some of those, because I, I know by contrast, though, you, you see a lot of dogs with ocular surface disease as well. But but let's look at some of these. And I, again, I've tried to pick things that I think are common and, and internationally common. Um, the, the dog in the, the top picture here is um, a dog that had um, uh, stromal ulcerative keratitis, but it's one which I'm sure you, many of you have seen, one of those older dogs with the the calcium degeneration, the calcareous degeneration, where they accumulate calcium in the stroma and then it suddenly chips out, leaving them with a sometimes a very deep um, non-infected ulcer that can be really difficult to heal in some of these older dogs. So a, an 
older dog degenerative process becomes a structural disease. Here's a, a no surprise to anybody, a Boston Terrier with uh, endothelial uh, dystrophy, a uh, dog with dry eye, very, very marked and advanced dry eye, a German Shepherd um, with panis here. And then that whole syndrome of brachycephalic ocular disease we see, whether it's a lower medial entropion or lag ophthalmos or trichiasis from nasal folds, et cetera, et cetera. Just that whole variety of diseases. So I've shown you two panels there, common feline ocular surface disease, common canine ocular surface disease, and did you notice the main difference between the two? Whereas we tend to blame herpes virus, chlamydia, the infectious agents for a, a huge majority of the feline ocular surface diseases, can you think of a major canine ocular surface pathogen? Depending on where you're listening in from around the world, I mean, Leishmania, maybe, um, distemper for sure, but these aren't just chronic, the distemper isn't your chronic recurrent ocular disease. It's this very sick dog that has ocular disease. Bordetella, maybe some ocular involvement, but when it comes to the ocular surface, the dog is remarkably resistant to infectious disease until of course it's ulcerated. Uh, whereas the cat seems to just head the list there and is, is very prone to infectious ocular disease. So you can sort of, you can sort of see my paradigm here and one I use when I go into the exam room to look at a dog or a cat, uh, if it's a dog and it's got keratitis or conjunctivitis or keratoconjunctivitis, then I'm going in there assuming that it's non-infectious. I've got in the back of my mind that it might be infectious but I'm gonna go very carefully looking for those non-infectious, degenerative, breed-related type causes, autoimmune type causes. When I go into the room with the cat, I'm still gonna think about those. I'm getting a bit better at thinking about cats with dry eye. I, I think they occur and I'm getting better at learning what they look like. I'm, I know cats get entropion and I'm always looking out for that. And, a cat could have a foreign body, which is causing that ocular surface disease. I'm going in there, I'm looking at that, but failing to find it, I'm falling back on that. It's almost certainly infectious. So I'm going in there with that mind shift. Infectious till proven otherwise in cats, non-infectious till proven otherwise in dogs. And it's almost more simple than that because although I'm sure we're missing a lot of infections, Although I'm sure there's infectious agents that we haven't learned about or don't know their full importance of yet. The majority of cat ocular disease, cat ocular surface disease, seems to be attributable to chlamydia or feline herpes virus. Now I can hear you in inverted commas, I can hear the, uh, those of you around the world saying, well, what about feline Khaleesi virus? What about mycoplasma? And I get it, those are important ocular pathogens. I think about Khaleesi virus though, more as perhaps that organism that is a bit like the distemper of the dog. That is, it makes the whole animal sick and oh, by the way, they have some conjunctivitis. And you'll see in a moment when I talk to you about how I diagnose and treat these diseases, I do think about mycoplasma but I lump it together with chlamydia. One is that I'm not absolutely certain of its pathogenic role. I know we see some of those nasty melting ulcers of cats that, have, that we can culture mycoplasma from, but we can also culture mycoplasma from a normal cat eye. And so I'm a little confused about where mycoplasma fits as a pathogen. But as you'll see in a minute, I'm gonna to talk to you about treatment in an empirical way, in a almost a guessing type way. And I, it doesn't matter if I guess if it's chlamydia or if I guess that it's mycoplasma, I'm gonna treat those two in the same way. So what about those diseases? Sure, I'm thinking about them, they're there, but the top of my list for all of these is chlamydia and feline herpes virus. So you can see that I'm going into the exam room with a cat with ocular surface disease almost in a binary sense. I'm keeping my mind open to those other diseases, 
I'm eliminating or ruling them out. And then I'm thinking, gee, I wonder, seeing as I couldn't see anything dramatic, whether this is chlamydia or herpes virus. So that might lead you uh, to a, a pretty obvious question. Well, if it's one of those two, and if those two require totally different therapies, the antiviral agents aren't anti-chlamydial. The anti-chlamydial agents aren't antiviral. So I need to know which one it is. I would say the most common question I get from veterinarians around the world is, so what's the best lab test? Should I be doing a culture? Should I be submitting that upper respiratory PCR panel? And I must say, when I get this question for, you know, what's the best laboratory test for either herpes virus or chlamydia or cats with ocular surface disease, I feel a bit like this. I really do feel like I, I, I'm letting you down because there is no reliable lab test for herpes virus for sure and chlamydia to some extent as well. Let me explain what I mean by that. We certainly have very, very reliable tests for detecting those organisms. What we don't have is a good way of saying that that detected organism is the cause of the disease. And here's why. Let's take feline herpes virus as our example. Feline herpes virus can be detected by PCR in particular because it's so sensitive. It can be detected in up to 50% of normal cats. Its normal repertoire of behavior is to shed silently. The virus lives in the ganglia, comes down the trigeminal nerve and is shared at the ocular surface and uh, other surfaces, the respiratory surface, maybe the oral surface. That's the way it just keeps perpetuating into the next generation of cats. And so we have asymptomatic or silent shedders of this virus, up to 50% in some studies with PCR. So that's a huge dilemma, right? That means that if I detect the virus, I have a 50% chance of detecting it in a normal animal. And it may have nothing to do with the disease in this diseased animal. It may be another one of those incidental shedding. By the way, the virus, the, uh, the tests also don't detect the difference between the vaccine, vaccinal virus, the vaccine virus, and the wild type. And so you can not differentiate those to not so much of an importance if you're doing injectable subcutaneous virus vaccinations, but if you're in a part of the world or you like to use those mucosal vaccines, the, the topical um, in the nose onto the ocular surface vaccines, those are detected by these PCR assays as well, and they'll further compound the results. Serology is certainly no good. Serology definitely can't de determine between any vaccine and the affected cats. And 97% of cats are zero positive. So you see the problem here. In fact, I, I credit my friend, Mike Lappin, who's done a spectacular um, study uh, where they took the chlamydial test or the antiviral or the feline herpes virus test and they treated based on the results and the cats didn't improve in the way they'd expected. So in other words, even using response to therapy Following the diagnostic test, these the diagnostic test didn't have an adequate positive or negative predictive value. But there is some good news. The good news is that even though the tests don't help me to determine whether I'm going to use an antiviral drug or an anti-chlamydial test, a, a drug, an anti-chlamydial drug, I've developed an alternative way to what I am fully admit is to guess. I use clinical signs as my first test and I use response to therapy as my second test. Now, straight away, I need to introduce the way, but many of you are thinking about this anyway. If this is a disease that was going to get better anyway, what's the point of using response to therapy? And I would tell you that the cases that I've developed this approach for are the ones that are referred to me as an ophthalmologist. By definition, they're the ones that didn't get better in general practice. So I understand I'm dealing with a potentially subtly different population, 
but I will still tell you that that has enabled me to suggest that there are now two therapies that are so good that they can be used as a diagnostic test. Let me explain that a little bit more. We have one antiviral drug that is so good against feline herpes virus that if the patient doesn't get better while on that drug, then I assume that it's not feline herpes virus. And we have one drug that's anti-chlamydial that's so well proven to not only cure the signs, but clear the organism. That is to um, um, resolve the disease and the infection in the animal. We have two such good drugs that we can use them in those resistant cases that I'm seeing as diagnostic tests. Now I've used that to help me to develop a set of clinical signs that I use to guess which one to use first. And I'm just gonna share those with you. I'm not gonna share them as like the gospel that this is the only way to do it, but I would love for you to try it and see if it works for you as well as over a career now it has worked for me in developing this. For those of you who aren't going to stay till the end of the seminar, here's the end of the seminar. It's not the end of the seminar, but it's the, it's the take home message. If you wanted to know, okay, what's the best drug for these? And, and then I need to go to bed tonight in India, or I need to uh, uh, get off to work in the U S depending on the time of day that you're watching. Then here's the, here's the end story. Here's the answer. FAM cyclovir, as I'll show you in a moment with, as we go through each of the drugs, is an amazing drug against feline herpes virus. It's good at controlling the disease. We don't have a drug that cures feline herpes virus. It controls the disease, but it doesn't eradicate the infectious organism. Along with that, I always use a topical hyaluronate. And here you see Anvisions and High Pro. I'll show you in a moment why, why I think Anhy Pro is so important in the management of infectious ocular disease, respective of cause, irrespective of cause. If it's chlamydia, then doxycycline is proven to not only resolve the clinical signs, which is what you and the owner want but to actually clear the organism from the cat as well. Again, along with topical hyaluronate. So you can see that we have a way now to resolve clinical signs in even the most resistant cases, the ones that, as I say, haven't been doing well in local general practice, maybe haven't been doing well at our local ophthalmologists and get get to come and see us at, the, at UC Davis. Famcyclovir is so good at resolving those when given in the way I'm gonna tell you during today's seminar. And that if it doesn't improve, then I'm, not, I'm highly suspicious it's not herpes virus. Likewise, doxycycline is so good at curing the disease that if it doesn't improve on uh, doxycycline, then I'm not convinced it's chlamydia. And always, 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 irrespective of diagnosis, they're getting anhypro, hyaluronate, as a means of controlling the, the goblet cell deficiency. And we're gonna talk quite a lot about why that's so important. So there you go. Um, uh, anyone who wants to log off now, you've, you've seen the end of the, the study, but the end of the uh, seminar, but let's work you through why and how I get to that decision-making. You can see that my approach here, and it's just one bloke's opinion. It's just, just something that has worked well for me. Uh, is that I think it's better to save my clients money on lab tests so that I can spend that money on the very best treatment possible and make the diagnosis while treating them. You can see why that's appealing to clients. And I use it as a way of getting their buy-in, of encouraging them to realize that they're part of the team that is treating their cat because if we're going to use response to therapy as a diagnostic test, which I unashamedly am, if we're going to use response to therapy as a diagnostic test, 
then we need to make sure that we use the very best therapy possible and that the client is compliant, that the client gives the drug as directed. If we don't do either of those things, then we can't say we've used it as a diagnostic test. If I was to take a drug we'll talk about in a minute, idoxuridine, that has to be given extremely frequently as an antiviral agent, and the clients, and, I, and either I prescribe it at twice a day, way too infrequently, or the clients can only administer it twice a day, way too infrequently. And if the cat doesn't respond, then we have completely wasted their money. As a team, we have made a bad decision. We didn't impress on them the importance of, of multiple times a day therapy and, and or they weren't able to follow that through. And we therefore just, we put on a drug that wouldn't, was never likely to work at the frequency we gave it. When they don't get better, we don't know that it wasn't herpes virus. We've made no diagnosis and we're right where we started, except that we're two weeks later, the clients have wasted a lot of money and the cat is now getting intolerant of eye drops. So you can see my, my, my approach here. My approach is understanding that I see a population that have got to the point where they just say, I want this over with. My approach with them is to say, I'm going to take, I'm going to save your money on tests, but I'm going to spend it on the very best therapy, which you have to give exactly as we talk about. And then we'll be able to use response to therapy as a diagnostic test. So you can see again, my approach is to walk into that room, if it's a cat with ocular surface disease, to look carefully for underlying pathology, finding none, finding no obvious cause through the exam, then I'm not gonna run a test. I'm gonna say, is it chlamydia or maybe mycoplasma? In which case I'll use doxycycline. Or is it feline herpes virus? In which case I'll use famcyclovir. I'm going there in there almost as if this is a binary decision, because at the end of the decision-making, I'm going to decide are they getting an antiviral or an anti-chlamydial drug plus hyaluron A. So I like to think about this as a binary decision. It's like I've got one of these old-fashioned scales, one of these old-fashioned balances on my um, uh, countertop in the exam room, an imaginary scale sitting in my head, but on that countertop. And in my pocket, I've got a pocket full of pebbles. And I'm gonna put a pebble on either the chlamydial side, mycoplasmal side, or the herpes virus side. I'm just gonna put pebbles out as I answer questions. And at the end of it, I'm gonna say it's tilting a little bit more towards antiviral, or it's tilting a little bit more towards an anti-chlamydial drug. I'm gonna make a weighted, guess. It's a weighted assessment that is absolutely a clinical guess. Because if the test has a 50% chance, if the PCR test has a 50% chance of being falsely positive, then I can flip a coin and be equivalent to the test. And I can make a, 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 an educated guess at hopefully better than 50% of the time. So here's the table that I use to make my guesses. You can see that in this column here, we have the signs that I think of as being highly associated with, not pathognomonic, highly associated with chlamydia or mycoplasma. And I really don't, as I say, I don't care which of those it is because response to therapy is my next test and the therapy for the two is the same. And in this column are some signs that I think of as associated with, and in one case, pathognomonic for feline herpes virus. Now I'm gonna walk you through because you'll notice that there's many, take these top two, the conjunctival signs, where herpes virus and chlamydia both cause the signs, but in slightly different weighted way. Remember, it's a weighted judgment. There are other things where these signs are very distinguishing in some circumstances, and there's one, there's one sign, the dendritic ulcers, dendrit, dendritic lesions, where the signs are pathognomonic. So let me walk you through my approach to a case. 
The first thing I'm going to ask myself is what's the degree of chemosis? What's the degree of conjunctival edema or conjunctival swelling? And you can see here that although herpes virus and chlamydia both cause conjunctival swelling, it's been my experience that chlamydia tends to cause a more dominant chemosis, a more, an inflammation that's more dominated by chemosis than herpes does. Whereas herpes virus tends to cause a conjunctive inflammation that's more dominated by hyperemia than it is by chemosis. So you see here, there's some relativity. There's relativity within herpes virus in how much chemosis versus hyperemia. And there's relativity within chemosis between the herpes virus and the chlamydia. So what's an easy way to remember this? The way I tell the students, the way I teach the students is that k -k -k chlamydia causes k -k -k chemosis and herpes causes hyperemia. Now, I get it, they both cause both, but we're gonna do a weighted judgment and say, for the degree of hyperemia here, how's the chemosis? And for the degree of chemosis, how's the hyperemia? And of all the chemosis I've ever seen in my life, is this really bad chemosis? Of all the hyperemia I've ever seen in my life, is this really bad hyperemia? We're gonna grade it, and then we're gonna come away with a decision. The next one, you can see, has the chance to be absolutely meaningless if you don't see ulceration or 100% meaningful if you do see conjunctival ulceration. So let's look at this for a minute. Notice that to the best of our knowledge, fearless and my chlamydia and mycoplasma don't cause conjunctival ulceration. Whereas herpes virus may cause conjunctival ulceration. Now that's a really important differentiation. Let's work through the case. You look at the case, you look carefully for conjunctive ulceration and you fail to find it. You've got to keep that pebble in your pocket, right? You can't put the pebble on the scale on either side. You look really carefully for conjunctive ulceration and you do find it. You can put all the pebbles on the herpes virus side and walk out of the exam room, you're done. If you believe my, if you believe my table, and and I, I I've got to ask for your trust along the way here. At some point, you have to get the pebbles out of your pocket. At some point, you have to choose an anti-chlamydial or an antiviral drug. Uh, or you could run a test. I'm not telling you not to run a test. I'm just telling you that I don't run tests. But you can see that therefore finding ulceration is critically important. Failing to find it if it's there is critically important. And it not being there is not very helpful at all. So that means we should look really hard for conjunctival ulceration. Now, what you might be asking is, how on earth do I see that? Well, there's at least two signs that are very, very useful and which we don't always think to look for. One is any sign of hemorrhage from the ocular surface is likely to be from conjunctival ulceration. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was herpes virus that caused it, don't get me wrong, but it means that there's ulceration. In other words, if you ulcerate the cornea, it doesn't bleed. If you ulcerate the conjunctiva, you'll get bleeding of that surface. So look for a serosanguinous discharge. Look for hemorrhage on the ocular surface. Second thing is to look for fluorescein retention on the conjunctiva. I know you're good at putting a drop of fluorescein on and staring at the cornea with a blue light. Stare at the conjunctiva as well. We should say that there was no corneal retention and or there was no conjunctival retention and or there was no ocular surface retention. We shouldn't just say fluorescein negative. Fluorescein negative doesn't mean anything until we define which surfaces we looked at. Let's do a couple of cases together. And, um, um, you know, what you can do if you like, the, the Q&A section is open and um, uh, Dr. Good is, is monitoring that for us. Um, so why don't, if you feel uh, comfortable and would like to type something in, let's look at this case in the top image here, up in the top left of the screen. 
and let's grade the chemosis together. Let's grade the hyperemia together. Let's look for any signs of conjunctival ulceration. And if anybody wants to write in there whether they think that that top left is more likely chlamydia or more likely herpes virus. Why don't you guys type away and uh, is that more chemotic than it is hyperemic? Is it more hyperemic than it is chemotic? Is there any sign of conjunctival isolation, ulceration? And based on that, can you say whether you think it's herpes virus or whether you think it's chlamydia? Kathy, a couple of answers starting to go in there and oh, people yeah. are willing to vote. Yes, absolutely. And I think we've got a, an A plus right now with everybody's answers. <laughs> That, uh, so as I look at this, I see a great deal of chemosis. I see virtually no hyperemia. In fact, it's, it's sort of markedly absent. I see uh, um, no signs of serosanguinous discharge. I'd have chlamydia higher on my list. I'd have put a pebble out for the chemosis because it's more chemotic than it is hyperemia. I'd have put a pebble out on the chlamydial side for the hyperemia because it's less hyperemic than I'd have expected. And I'd have put um, no pebbles out because I failed to see ulceration. Now, by contrast, have a look at the bottom right here. Here, we've got an intensely hyperemic, ulcerated because it's bleeding. You can see here some overt hemorrhage, and you can see here a pink serosanguinous discharge, overt hyperemia, very little chemosis. So there's a pebble out on the herpes side for the markedly hyperemic. There's a pebble out on the herpes virus side for the not very chemotic. And then every pebble you've got in your pocket goes out there on the herpes virus side for the conjunctival ulceration. You walk away and you decide whether you're going to use an antiviral or not. Keratitis. And by keratitis, I don't mean ulcers, although that's one form of keratitis. Keratitis means, is there any sign of corneal inflammation? Corneal blood vessels, corneal edema, corneal white blood cell infiltrate. Sure, corneal ulceration with malacia or not, with stromal loss or not. In other words, is the cornea involved? Because again, look at the distribution of signs here. To the best of our knowledge, chlamydia doesn't routinely cause corneal irritation in cats. To the best of our knowledge, feline herpes virus may cause it. Doesn't always. In fact, feline herpes virus prefers the conjunctiva. But you can see here, once again, if you can find evidence of keratitis, then you can put all the pebbles on the herpes virus side and walk out. If you can't find evidence of keratitis, it could be still either disease. And then dendrites, dendritic lesions on the cornea, those linear to branching lesions, punk date originally, linear later on, branching ultimately, those are pathognomonic for herpes viruses of all species, by the way, and the cat's just a really good example of it. And here's a, a beautiful slide given to me by Terry Kinvig, and I just love this. And, and the reason I'm using one of his slides, not only because of how beautiful it is, and Terry takes just wonderful photos, but I'm taking it his because it's the, the I have very few in my, my collection. A guy who loves herpes virus, and I very rarely see dendritic ulcers. So I'm not, I'm suggesting there that I hope that you'll go looking for them, that you'll use them for all of the diagnostic power they have, but that you won't be expecting to see them very often. Notice down the bottom here, a cat that also has that sort of same starburst punk date to linear, um, but these are scars, these are fluorescein negative. That's still for me, suggestion that this cat almost certainly had a previous corneal dendritic lesion that uh, is now just left a fluorescein negative scar, a, star, a scar that's not retaining uh, fluorescein on the cornea. Well, get ready to type in the, get ready to type in the Q&A section again, uh, everybody, because what I'm hoping you'll do is do another case with me where you'll work out whether you think it is most likely herpes or whether you think it's most likely chlamydia, or maybe you'll be more certain than most likely. Maybe you'll see something that you're convinced of. 
So this is Buddy. Buddy was an adult. I forget his exact age, but he was an, she, she was an adult female spade Abyssinian cat. And she presented to us with just a very chronic month, um, multiple month long history of squinting and discharge from the right eye. The left eye was never involved and the pupils have been pharmacologically dilated as part of our ophthalmic exam. There was no other intraocular disease. So she was a normal cat, healthy and well, with normal intraocular findings, but who had signs of squinting and discharge for multiple months. Here you can see the both eyes from a distance and go ahead and note whatever lesions you can from a distance. Then I'm going to hone in and show you a higher, um, um, higher magnified view of this um, right eye in a moment. But first of all, start collecting your thoughts on any abnormalities you can see here. And here is that right eye now being held open. Uh, the third eyelid therefore has protruded a little further across the eye. We did that as part of this manipulation, but you can see that it was already a little protruded here uh, compared to this other one and a little more red than you'd expect. And here now you see it um, at, in, in this cat. And you can see some discharge. You can characterize that discharge if you like. You can see the rest of the uh, ocular surface uh, or at least a, a majority of it. And I wondered if you'd care to write in the um, Q&A section there, are you going to go for herpes virus or are you going to go for chlamydia or mycoplasma? Said another way, are you thinking of using an antiviral drug to now treat this cat of multiple months duration or are you thinking of using an anti-chlamydial drug for, using, for treating this potentially chlamydial infection of multiple months duration? I see some answers starting to appear there in the Q&A, that's great. And Dr. Good, is there, a, is there a majority opinion? There is, a majority is voting for herpes virus, Dr. Maddox. I love it, I love it. I am with the majority on this occasion. And for those of you who said, well, it's very hyperemic and not really at all noticeably chemotic, so that tends you that direction. That's great. Uh, it, I don't see any overt ulceration. I would love to put fluorescein on and look at this surface. Um, it's certainly getting to the point of almost little hemorrhages here, but I don't see any ulcerative surfaces. The big secret is when you apply this sort of list here, we're starting to head towards herpes virus with our guesses. But now as we zoom in, and I uh, appreciate that some of you might say, well, I couldn't see that on that little photo you gave me. But as we zoom in, do you see that there are many blood vessels here that are crossing the corneoscleral limbus? Here's the corneoscleral limbus, the junction between the cornea and the sclera. There are blood vessels, superficial blood vessels that are coming out maybe up to one to almost two millimeters here. And the, therefore this cat has keratitis, whether we, it doesn't have to be ulcerative. We just say there is signs of corneal inflammation and chronic corneal inflammation, by the way, chronic superficial corneal inflammation because these blood vessels are um, like trees. They come with a single trunk and divide a lot. That's a sign of a superficial vessel. You see how this guess relies on you doing a really close eye exam. For those of you, and, and we're not going to divert for long here, but because uh, we could do a whole seminar on how to do a really good eye exam. But remember that when you go to the eye doctor, they will use bright lights and magnification. And you need to, when the patient comes to you, use bright lights and magnification. You might buy some expensive surgical loops. They're a great way to examine the eye as well. You might be in the group who says, I love ophthalmology so much, I've got a slit lamp. That's great. You will see things that you can't see with any other method using that. And you might be in the group who says, I, I, not, I can't afford any of those. I don't see that many eyes. I'm not that intrigued. 
then here's a about a $40, um, 40 US dollar um, magnification device that will give you a much improved eye exam. You might be in the group who says, and I don't blame them, who says, I'm not even gonna spend $40 on an eye exam. In which case I would say to you, please at least get out the otoscope. Take the little magnifying lens on the otoscope and examine the eye with some form of magnification. Go down to the local pharmacy, to the local chemist, the drugstore, and buy yourself some plus two uh, reading glasses for a few bucks at the local uh, drugstore, local pharmacy. Something that'll give you magnification because seeing those blood vessels just made us choose an antiviral drug instead of an anti-chlamydial drug. Well, you've now heard all that I know about how to guess the diagnosis. And I admit it's a guess, it's an educated guess, but I bet you it's better than 50% right. And the next step I'm gonna do is response to therapy. But before I do that, um, Dr. Good, this might be a spot for us to pause. I know um, you might have some questions already in the Q&A section. Yeah, we, if that's the case, I'd be delighted to answer them. Yeah, we do. We've got some great questions so far. Um, one, let's see, we've got some diagnostic and some therapeutic questions. Um, let's see here. When you suggested checking response to treatment, how many days are we looking at? Just in case the clinical signs don't settle with one treatment protocol, would it make sense to put the cat on both famcyclovir and doxycycline, which was a, a common question we got? Yeah, let me let me answer that one by saying I hope you can stay uh, a little longer because we're definitely going to address both of those. But here's the short answer: if you can't stay longer, the the both drugs are remarkably effective. And in the chronic cases that I'm seeing, we see a response within the first seven to 10 days. In less chronic cases, my less I've had less experience, but my feeling is that the response is even more rapid. So I give them at least seven to 10 days to show whether they're likely to be improving or not. As for how long to go, we'll definitely cover that as well. But for those of you who have to go and need the answer right now, it's four weeks for uh, the doxycycline and until better for the famcyclovir. I'll explain that some more. And as for the question of should we use both at once, you certainly could. Here's the two potential downsides and the reason that I don't. It's not that it's wrong to do it. Here's the two potential downsides. One is that I'm seeing, remember, cases that are often chronic and often recurrent. And what I want to use is response to therapy as a diagnostic test. I don't want them to have to come back to me every time for me to go through all of this again and give them both therapies every time and for me to never know which one it was. So I, if I use two at once, I'll never know which one worked. I won't have made a diagnosis. That's fine. Many of you would be happy with that. That's great. In my situation, I want to use one. And if that doesn't work, use the other. And I'll show you that. The second reason not to use both at once, and it's not a reason, it's not a contraindication, it's just a relative contraindication, is that you more than double oh, there is, uh, your chances of a side effect. And we'll talk about the side effects of both of those drugs. But remember, doxycycline is good at esophageal strictures. Famcyclovir is good at GI disturbance. Uh, Doxy is good at GI disturbance. So we've got, we've got um, a, a chance of increasing our risks. Great. Couple diagnostic questions. Can follicular conjunctivitis be a sign of chlamydia felis infection? This is a, thank you. This is a great question. And certainly um, follicular conjunctivitis has been traditionally thought of as very characteristic of chlamydia. And I believe that's true. The problem is I think that follicular conjunctivitis is perhaps more accurately described as very characteristic of chronic anagenic stimulation of which chlamydia is a very regular cause. So you get what I'm doing here. I'm hedging a little bit. I'm saying, Follicular conjunctivitis, absolutely, I would have chlamydia on my list. And for some reason, more so than herpes virus. I'm not sure why herpes doesn't seem to do that. 
So I, I love the question because it enables me to say, yes, I do like the idea of uh, follicular conjunctivitis steering you towards chlamydia. The thing that I don't want to do is go as far as saying that it's pathognomonic, which some of the old textbooks did say. I think we now know that it's pathognomonic for chronic antigenic stimulus, of which chlamydia is a very solid example. Great. Thanks, David. And then um, a question about the PCR testing. Why is the herpes PCR test so often negative in diseased cats, even though an appropriate um, tool was used to get the sample like a side of brush and chlamydia PCR and mycoplasma as well. Yeah, thank you. I've emphasized why I don't like the, the tests because they can be falsely positive. This is a great question because this emphasizes they can also sometimes be falsely negative. By the way, another reason not to use them. So um, still supporting the general premise that I'm trying to promote, which is make a clinical guess. Um, and the reason they can be falsely negative is, is three or four different stages of the process. One is that there may truly be no virus present at that time, and yet the virus is the cause. The virus can be shared in variable amounts at variable times in the disease. Certainly, we also know that the virus can be regionally spread. You know, for instance, remember herpes virus also causes cold sores. So cold sores are often recur at a very focal spot and a very repeatable spot on a person's lip. So we do know that the virus can be shared in a, in a, in a geographic, a, an anatomic region. So you might miss it because of timing. You might miss it because of sample site. Then again, it may be there, but you didn't collect it because of your sampling technique. And I appreciate that the person who asked the question already knew that and had said, but what about even if I do all of that correct? Thirdly, it can be lost or degrade en route to the lab. Not very much with PCR and the DNA virus, not very much. Thirdly, of course, you could have errors at the lab itself, whereby the test is, uh, well, let's say they could have errors, that is that it's red negative when it wasn't, but you could also have a situation where there was less virus than the test is, uh, than, than that lab's cutoff point. So there's all sorts of ways in which we could get a false negative, as well as, of course, all the ways we can get what are disease false positives, but a tr test true positives. We just have a couple more that might fit in well from a diagnostic yeah. standpoint here. Let's um, do those. Yeah. So can herpes virus cause facial irritation? And how often do you see this with ocular lesions? Yeah. A really good question, and one which I'm going to have to answer from the extrapolation from humans' point of view, because we can see a cat that is rubbing their face and which we suspect herpes virus on, but it's a, a paresthesia, um, irritation is a, or nerve stimulation or unusual nerve feelings, of course, are symptoms, not signs. We see the sign of rubbing or the sign of self-trauma. So the short answer is almost certainly, given that this virus shares so many other characteristics with the human herpes virus, and because the human herpes virus is very good at doing that, even a neuralgia that runs up and down nerves. And so shingles, of course, is a, is a herpes virus of humans. So anybody who's experienced that knows yeah. incredible either itchiness and or um, pain associated with that. Uh, this has led some to be interested in the use of gabapentin and I have for feline herpes virus, and I have absolutely no experience with that, but it's a great question, Kathy, and I am, I'm almost certain that it must occur given how like human herpes virus, feline herpes virus is. Okay, great. And then can you comment on your use of the vital stains, rose bengal, lysamine green, um, whether you <laughs> use them as well as fluorescein in your patients? Um, Ron Offrey is good at saying there are, there are good questions, great questions, and excellent questions. And that is an excellent question because it leads perfectly into the next slide. This okay. slide is, <laughs> this slide uh, is showing two patients, a human in the top left and a cat in the bottom right, two patients who have been stained with Rose Bengal. And whenever I say Rose Bengal, you should um, hear 
rose bengal or lysamine green because both of those stains stain very similarly. Uh, they appear different, of course. What I mean is they can be used for a diagnostically similar approach. And they stain, uh, for those who don't know this, the questioner obviously does, but for those who don't know this, they stain um, either uh, uh, dead or dying epithelial cells. Think for a minute about the corneal epithelium, uh, six, seven layers of epithelial cells thick. You could lose five, four, five of those layers, and that would be a fluorescein negative cornea, right? Because fluorescein sticks to the stroma. You have to lose the epithelium and expose the collagen. That, however, would be a rose bengal or lysamine green positive cornea. So the rose bengal stain, lysamine green stain, um, is a really good way of detecting here, uh, as shown in this photo, those dendrites that are very early. They're not yet spreading horizontally to lose their dendritic fashion, and they're not yet deep enough to be fluorescein positive. And so uh, rose bengal and lysamine green are really good stains for detecting very early herpes virus disease. Uh, they're not necessary to detect the later ulcerative ones. And so I think they form a really good um, addition to, but not instead of fluorescein. And if you have the choice, lysamine green is much kinder on the cornea than rose bengal is. So lysamine green is the preferred. And here you see a human eye in the top left and a cat eye in the bottom right, both of which have dendritic ulcers, both of which have been stained by rose bengal. And that's my intro for you into antiviral therapy, because there are no drugs that were developed for feline herpes virus, and there are no drugs that were developed for cats with feline herpes virus. That means that we are very fortunate that there is a very closely related but non-zoonotic virus of humans HSV1 or herpes simplex virus, because there are a number of drugs that have been developed for HSV1 that are somewhat effective, variably effective against feline herpes virus. And there are a number of drugs that were developed for humans infected with HSV1 that are variably safe in cats. You see what we have to do, the moment we borrow a drug that was developed for a different virus in a different species, and we use it for a uh, feline herpes virus in cats, we are taking two giant leaps of faith. We are saying, I hope it's effective, even though it's a different virus, and I hope that it's safe, even though it's a different host. The, the efficacy guess is completely unreliable. There is no way to guess which drugs are going to be good against both viruses or good against one only. The only way to do that is for us to test them in the lab. The good news for you is that those have been tested in multiple labs, and I'm going to share with you only the drugs that are effective. What I'm cautioning you about is any drug that I don't talk about today or the next antiviral drug that isn't available yet we don't know whether that will have any effect against feline herpes virus. That would be okay, it wouldn't be good. That would be okay if it was also safe, and that is not reliable either. There are a number of antiviral drugs that are particularly dangerous in cats. And as I'll show you in a moment, antiviral drugs as a rule tend to be way less safe than do antibacterial drugs, for instance. So whereas you might find yourself saying, we'll just put him on an antibiotic, it won't do any harm. By the way, not strictly true all the time, but you might find yourself saying that. You should never say, find yourself saying, we'll just put him on an antiviral, it won't do him any harm. That's the sort of intro for you on those. In fact, that leads to this general slide here about antiviral drugs. And notice the subtitle. The residents at Davis get used to me saying, so do you think he's earned an antiviral? They'll come out of the exam room, they'll explain, they describe the case to me. And before I go in and look with them, 
and we're starting to talk about therapy, I'll say, so do you think he's earned an antiviral? You have to earn one. You don't just get it on your first visit necessarily. And I'd love for you to all think about that as you think, okay, the first thing I'm going to do is try to work out if he gets an anti-chlamydial or an antiviral drug. The second thing I'm going to do is to say, has he earned either one of those? Is his disease sufficiently severe? Has it been chronic enough? Has it been severe enough? Has it been recurrent enough? Is the cornea involved? I'm more likely to treat corneal than conjunctival disease earlier in the course. Just think to yourself, have they earned one? Because here's the downsides. Here's the risks of antiviral therapy. The first one I sort of indicated is they're way more toxic and they're toxic at a topical level as well. They make corneal epithelial cells and to a lesser extent conjunctival epithelial cells. They make corneal epithelial cells sick. They make little punk date lesions that are rose bengal positive on the corneal epithelium. In other words, the antiviral drugs can produce corneal signs that look just like the disease. And that's a bit of a problem, right? That's a little bit confusing. So just keep in mind that they have to be earned, that we use them at the right frequency for the right period of time, and then we stop them. They're not something that we aim to have the patient on chronically. And then remember that anything you're giving systemically could also have systemic effects. Um, depending on where you are around the world, they are almost certainly extra label in that they're not licensed for use in cats. Uh, to best of my knowledge, there's no antiviral agent anywhere in the world that's licensed for use in the cat. Uh, I, I don't, as I say, to the best of my knowledge, you'll know your local regulations better than I do. Um, they're often, uh, the drugs I'm going to talk to you about often would need to be compounded. And that produces all sorts of medico legal issues for you in your area of the world. So I do want to just say you have to earn uh, that extra step as well. None of them is antibacterial. I'll just throw that in there so that if the, let's say the cat has a corneal ulcer and you think that feline herpes virus is the cause of that ulcer and you decide that he's earned an antiviral, he still needs an antibacterial if you're worried about bacterial infection. No antiviral drug is antibacterial. No antibacterial drug is antiviral for feline herpes virus. Let's concentrate though on that major bullet. They are all virus static. Now, a lot of the time I'm going to, you've seen I've been doing it already, draw these analogies between antibacterial, antibiotics, and antiviral drugs. You're very used to make wise decisions, think carefully about antibacterial drugs. I want you, and I want all of us, to think really carefully about antiviral drugs because they're just a different form of antimicrobial. They're just as, they deserve our respect just as much, maybe more. So let me draw an analogy here. You're already used to what bacteria static and bactericidal means. You already know that if you had a dog with a dermatitis, a bacterial dermatitis, and all things were equal, the, the, the culture suggested that the, the dog's disease was um, suscept equally susceptible to drug A and drug B. Drug A and drug B were both twice a day. They were both similarly safe. They both cost the same amount. But one was bactericidal and one was bacteriostatic. You'd take the bactericidal drug every time. You don't have that option with virus drug, antiviral drugs. There are no virucidal antiviral drugs. They're all virus static. Now let's think about what that means. That means that the antiviral drug, for as long as it's present, is saying to the virus, don't replicate quite so well while I'm here, but I'll be gone pretty soon. Now let's take an eyedropper. This is really important because this is going to determine why we don't use idoxyuridine twice a day. Not only because it's not a diagnostic test if we use it twice a day, but because it's a great way to induce resistance. Let's just take an eye drop. How long does an eye drop stay on the surface of the eye? Five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe, probably not. 
let's exaggerate it. Let's say it's 15 minutes. And let's say the client can says to you, I can only put the drop on twice a day. Then that's 30 minutes of therapy, 30 minutes, maximum, 30 minutes of therapy. Now it's a virus static drug. That means for 30 minutes a day, the drug is saying to the virus, don't replicate quite so well for these 30 minutes. I'll be gone though soon and you can replicate as much as you like for the other 23 and a half hours of today. Now you know why antiviral drugs have to be given really frequently, particularly when they're topical. And by the way, animals with irritated eyes have even more epiphora and wash drops off and dilute drops much faster than even the normal animal. The other thing we've got to know about virus static is because the latent virus in the trigeminal ganglia, because the latent virus lying latent in the trigeminal ganglia by definition isn't replicating. That's the definition of latency is that it's laying there without replicating. Then a virus static drug will never harm it. It's got to replicate to have the antiviral drug work. So we'll never have a cure for latency for as long as we've only got anti, um, uh, virus static antiviral drugs. And then think about induction of resistance. Bacteria static drugs are way more likely, particularly when used to lower dose or less frequently, are way more likely to induce resistance than are bactericidal. Said another way, dead bugs don't mutate. <laughs> so if you kill them with a bactericidal or a virucidal drug, they're not going to learn resistance to you. If you just slow them down and mutate them, and that's what antiviral drugs do, they induce mutations. That, by the way, is why they're so dangerous, because they induce mu DNA mutations. The vi herpes virus is a DNA virus. And they, in they induce mutations of human cells or of cat cells as well. That's why they're so um, dangerous. It's also why they're very good at inducing resistance, especially when used at too low a dose. So that was my sort of up on my soapbox. When I talk to you about, please use this drug this many times a day, it's not just because, oh, well, it'll be more effective then. It's because that's the way we'll keep this drug so that we can use it in a patient next year <clears throat> or our, so that our residents and our children will have that drug available to them as well. Well, if that was the slide that covered all of the antiviral drugs, these are points, these sort of half dozen bullets here, you could put at the top of every other slide I'm gonna show you. Because what I'm gonna do now, <coughs> excuse me, is go through a variety of antiviral drugs. I'm well aware that we have an audience here from all around the world. And therefore, there's no way for me to tailor this discussion for just your neck of the woods. But I am going to tell you about the drugs that I know of, the drugs that I've discovered are available around the globe when I've gone uh, lecturing um, for your groups here, there, and everywhere. Cytofovir is a, they're all human drugs, remember, it's an anti HSV drug. It is available only in an injectable form. And yet we do not use it systemically in cats. We have make it with into an eye drop by um, combining it with artificial tears. <clears throat> so let me say that again. We're going to make a 0.5% ophthalmic solution by dissolving cytofovir as originally described in a methyl cellulose tears and one drop twice daily. Always in these slides, you're going to see the most important feature of the drug highlighted in gold. <clears throat> this drug's benefit is that it can be given twice daily. And you can see that Jennifer Fontenelle at Colorado State at the time did a study there where when applying it twice daily in a um, um, group of experimentally inoculated cats with a control group and a masked observer, so one of our premium um, levels of evidence-based of, uh, evidence medicine, she was able to show a decrease in the amount of herpes virus shed and a decrease in the amount of signs of disease. <clears throat> Why only twice a day when I'm telling you all these drugs have to be given much more frequently than that? Using an analogy again, think of cytofovir as the 
azithromycin of antivirals. It is taken up and forms a tissue reservoir inside the cell. So it, that is an advantage in at least two or three ways. One is once it enters the cell, no amount of tearing or epiphora can wash it off the surface. It's in the cell. Secondly, it uh, uh, stays there longer and forms this tissue reservoir. And best of all, thirdly, the virus is an obligate intracellular virus. Herpes virus has to live with inside, within cells. Therefore, instead of the, the drug being extracellular and the virus catching it on its way between two cells, cytofovir is sitting inside the epithelial cell. When the virus enters, ready to uh, um, play mayhem, make its mayhem inside that cell, the cytofovir is already waiting and ready to tackle the virus. <clears throat> Those make for a fantastic series of effects. And it's one of the reasons it's one of my favorite drugs. You have to have it compounded. It's in the US anyway, it's very expensive. Um, and the other downside is that the reason this never made it to market for humans as a topical drug is that it is known to cause scarring of the nasolacrimal duct. So uh, one of its, um, um, mutating or DNA side effects is to cause a scarring over of the nasolacrimal duct. That's not been observed to the best of my knowledge. Uh, I've never seen it and it's not been des described by anybody to the best of my knowledge in cats. But we should know that that was the reason that this is available only as an injectable drug in humans and not as a topical drug. Now, with it being expensive and with it being required to be compounded, we're really lucky that Dr. Stiles out of Purdue and her group looked at how well does it last after it's compounded. Now, I want to be really clear. This is how long does it remain effective? She didn't look, and it's not a criticism of the study, I'm just pointing out the, uh, the boundaries of the study. She didn't look at whether the drug changed and became unsafe in some way. She only looked at whether it retained efficacy. So it's an in vitro study where they stored the compounded cytofovir in plastic or in glass. So you can think about whether your compounding um, pharmacy provides it to you in plastic or glass. It's not going to matter. They stored it at a regular refrigerator, a regular freezer, and a, um, a low uh, temperature freezer. They stored it for anything from one month up to six months. And the really good news is not one of those storage mechanisms, uh, methods, storage combinations in any combination had any deleterious effect on the efficacy. We don't know about safety. Now the good news is therefore, here's a compounded drug, which is expensive, at least in many countries of the world. The good news is you can tell the client who has a cat with chronic herpetic disease, use it until the cat's better, then stop, keep it in the fridge. It's good for at least six months, according to this study. The one thing I'll point out is the original study in cats was done with the drug dissolved in methyl cellulose. The study looking at longevity was done in normal saline. They were both 0.5% solutions though. I don't know whether that had any effect. The second drug I'll talk to you about, second antiviral drug, is idoxyuridine. And I really like this drug because this one was once available as an ophthalmic ointment or an ophthalmic uh, drop. Therefore, we know about FDA, in our country anyway, the uh, Federal Dr uh, Drug Administration, the Food and Drug Administration, the federal agency, we know that it was tested and regulated for topical ophthalmic use. That's never been the case for cytofovir. It is no longer available in a commercial preparation, but at least that gives me the confidence to say to the compounding pharmacist, please make it in the same concentrations as it used to be made in the regulatory body approved drug. That was a 0.1% eye drop or a 0.5% eye ointment. Now, at least here in the US, that makes it a very inexpensive drug compounded. Um, and this is a drug that has great in vitro efficacy against the virus as well. So the, I'm only gonna tell you uh, about drugs that are effective against the virus. 
Um, or if I tell you about others, I'm going to say don't use them because they're ineffective. Whereas cydofovir has some of those side effects or worrisome potential side effects, quite irritating, causes a bad blepharitis, could cause nasolacrimal duct scarring. Idoxuridine seems to be really well tolerated. So that's one of its major advantages as well. Here's the first of the drugs though, all the rest of the drugs that have to be given so frequently. Remember that virus static, eye drop only present for a short time of the day, short period of the day thing. And then you realize that even at five times a day, and let's say that drop stays there for 10 minutes, then you're still only getting 50 minutes of slowing the virus down and no time of viral killing, of course. Idoxuridine, good as an ointment or a drop, well tolerated, um, inexpensive in the US anyway, uh, but has to be given really frequently. I hope a lot of you uh, have access to what's one of the relatively new, compared to the others anyway, um, uh, topical ophthalmic. Perhaps one of the reasons that idoxuridine and trifluridine and the others are no longer available is that this one has largely replaced them in the topical human antiviral um, realm. It's a, a gancyclovir. It's a gel, which means that it's got a little bit longer topical um, uh, duration still has to be given very, very frequently, probably, certainly based on human recommendations it does. Um, it's very effective against the virus. Um, Dr. Lewin um, out of Louisiana State and others have looked at its efficacy against the virus in vitro. And then he has also looked at it, how well tolerated it is on normal cat eyes. And when given only three times daily, and remember, this isn't a recommendation of how often you should give it. This is just how often he gave it to normal cats to make sure that it didn't produce uh, serious side effects. Uh, it was very well tolerated. Now, how often should it be given? Probably, again, multiple, five, six times a day because of that virus static thing. I have virtually no experience with this because until recently this drug has been extraordinarily expensive. I mean frighteningly expensive, two, three hundred dollars for a little tube like this and I just haven't had the chance to use it in cats. The anecdotal reports, and unfortunately we don't have any uh, veterinary reports that I'm aware of yet, the anecdotal reports are that it's very well tolerated, um, sorry that it works very well, uh, our European um, diplomats are telling us that they see good results with cats. Now, many more of you around the world may have access to acyclovir. We don't have access to an ophthalmic acyclovir uh, here in the US, so I can't give you personal experience of having used this in patients. And I do want to caution you that this has to be an ophthalmic version of acyclovir you will almost certainly be able to get a dermatologic preparation of acyclovir for treating cold sores on lips, and that should not be used in the eye. But if you do have access to an acyclovir ophthalmic ointment in your neck of the woods, it's probably 3% acyclovir, and that has been tested and reported by David Williams out of the UK, and we're really grateful to him because he was able to show that when he took 30 cats that did actually test positive for feline herpes virus and had the disease and had signs, that you can see that when they got here in the open circles, three weeks of an anti-chlamydial drug, they, did, they had no improvement at all. And then as soon as they started the acyclovir, the number of cats with residual disease reduced dramatically over the next uh, 10 or 20 days. So interestingly, uh, the cats that received it only three times a day did not improve until it was increased to five times daily. Again, reinforcing that if we're going to use this in its correct manner as a virus static drug and with response to therapy being an important test, then you've got to be using these drugs very frequently. While we're on the topic of acyclovir, I do want to talk about 
briefly and in a negative way, I do want to talk about systemic acyclovir. It's available as oral pills, available as an oral suspension, um, and it should not be used in cats. So here's the two reasons, actually three that are sort of wound into two. The first is that it's just not very effective against the virus. If we take acyclovir and try to kill virus in a Petri dish, you have to put in huge quantities of acyclovir before it is effective. That would be okay if we could get huge quantities into a cat and if it was safe, but they're the two next things. It's very hard to get huge quantities into a cat. This is a drug that has low bioavailability. That is to say you or I or a cat swallows acyclovir and it is very poorly absorbed. That's a bad thing when you need really high plasma concentrations for it to be effective. The second reason that, it's, that we don't use it in cats is that really high plasma concentrations are really dangerous for cats. Remember, this is a drug that affects mutations, that mutates DNA. Where's there lots of DNA and lots of cell replication in the bone marrow? And so this drug knocks out cat's bone marrow. It's reversible. You take them off the drug and they bounce back, but it's dangerous. And I'll show you in the next slide just how dangerous it is. Now, this dose rate, 50 milligrams per kilogram, I don't want you to write it down. I don't want you to do this. This drug not only at that dose rate wasn't effective, but produced some side effects. Here's Here's the take home. When you gave it, when, when cats were given 50 milligrams twice per kilogram twice daily, the plasma concentration of the drug was only 40% of what it was required to do to, to be antiviral. So we do the tests in vitro first, we work out how much of the drug you need, then we do the cat tests in cats to say, can I get that high? And with this virus, with this drug, you couldn't get as high as you needed. You couldn't get to 50% of the way of what you needed to control the virus. <clears throat> Taking the safety and the therapeutic range, and you can see that that window, that little bit in the middle is just too narrow. Now, drugs with low bioavailability, if they're effective, like this drug is in humans, and if they're safe, like this drug is in humans, then drugs with low bioavailability can be tweaked. They can be changed by those clever drug manufacturers and they can be made into what's called a prodrug. And valacyclovir is a prodrug of acyclovir. You ingest, you eat, swallow valacyclovir. Your body absorbs valacyclovir really well across the small, animal, across the small intestine and your liver converts it to acyclovir. So you see what we did? We got around that low bioavailability problem. And this drug works just the same way in cats. That is to say, they ingest this, it gets absorbed really well, and their liver converts it into acyclovir at fatal concentrations. So valacyclovir kills cats because it makes them get high concentrations of acyclovir. So I'm gonna be a little bit pedantic here for a minute. Valacyclovir isn't strictly speaking the toxic drug. It's acyclovir that's toxic. Valacyclovir is just the clever way of getting high concentrations. So this teaches us don't use valacyclovir, but it also teaches us don't try to get acyclovir concentrations that are sufficient to control the virus. So no acyclovir, no valacyclovir. Well, that made us very interested and very nervous when we saw famcyclovir come out 10, 20, 10, 15 years ago. Famcyclovir was another one of these prodrugs. Famcyclovir has no antiviral efficacy at all. It doesn't have any antiviral, but it's really well absorbed. And once absorbed, via two steps that you can see in this slide here, it gets converted into pencyclovir. And pencyclovir 
is really effective against feline herpes virus and human herpes virus, which is why it got developed. So famcyclovir gets absorbed across the small intestine really well. It gets one step of, con of metabolism in, a, in probably multiple or unknown places, um, the GI tract, uh, the bloodstream, the liver, to this intermediary. This intermediary has no antiviral effect. And then it gets oxidized, uh, oxidated, oxidized in the liver by a known enzyme, a very specific enzyme. And then you make pencyclovir. And this enzyme, wouldn't you know it, you know what cats are like with liver metabolism, right? Cats do liver metabolism stuff differently, weirdly, unexpectedly. And cats have 2% of human aldehyde oxidase. Therefore, they're one fiftieth as good at our, as we are at metabolizing this drug. Now, you're already used to this. You already know to take drugs that might be completely safe in a dog, but because cats metabolize them poorly, can be very dangerous in a cat or have to be used at lower doses or less frequently. That's what we do, right? If a cat takes a drug that they metabolize poorly and when metabolizes, metabolism is the way of excreting and degenerating the drug, we give them lower doses less frequently. Take that same information. The, the, the knowledge is still correct. Cats metabolize famcyclovir badly. But here, we don't want the cat to metabolize the famcyclovir so that it's excreted. We want the cat to metabolize the famcyclovir so that it's activated into pencyclovir. So take everything you know and turn it on its head. Cats need this drug at higher doses more frequently than humans or dogs because they need, we need to get as much famcyclovir as they'll tolerate into them so that, they, so that we reach that sort of choke point on their enzymes. We reach that rate limiting step where we have their aldehyde oxidase doing as much conversion of famcyclovir as it can so that we get as much pencyclovir as we can in cats. Now, I'm really fortunate over the last uh, 13, 14 years to have worked alongside Sarah Thomasy, Lionel Sabag, Andrew Woodward, others who have done amazing job looking at famcyclovir. You can imagine that working out the dose in cats, given how weirdly they metabolize it, is really difficult. This was a pharmacologic challenge and it's taken them 13 or 14 years between them to do this. And I can't, uh, I can't um, uh, in a few minutes, all I can do is summarize for you what all of their data points towards. And I know that there are a whole bunch of people around the world who think that this dose is excessive. I get it. And we know it to be true from a pure science point of view. And many of you know, suspect it to be untrue from a I see this response point of view. But let me tell you about what the science shows and, at the, and I believe shows very clearly. That is that if you are to achieve therapeutic plasma concentrations and therapeutic tier concentrations. And that's going to be really important when I talk to you some more in the next slide. If you're to achieve concentrations in the blood and in the tears that are therapeutic against this virus and at the highest level possible that will inhibit its growth, remember it's not cidal, it's static, then you need to give 90 milligrams per kilogram twice daily. You can get almost as good with 40 milligrams per kilogram three times daily. We don't recommend that because it's much more difficult in general to pill a cat three times a day than twice a day. However, if you have an owner who says, 
money is absolutely everything to me. And the difference between a total of 180 milligrams per kilogram per day, that's 90 twice, and 120 milligrams per kilogram per day, that's 43 times, then that matters. Or if you have an owner who says, I can't give this huge tablet twice a day, but I can give a smaller tablet three times a day. If you weigh all of that up, then, and if the cat isn't overly stressed by three times a day versus two times a day, then you could give 40 milligrams per kilogram three times per day. But we, we currently recommend 90 milligrams per kilogram twice a day. And a lot of people will say, well, what's the course? How long should I give an antiviral drug? And by the way, this is the same for all the other antiviral drugs I just finished talking about. And I'm, my answer to you is to turn it back to you and say, well, how long do you have to give an antibacterial drug? And you say, well, that depends on the disease. I say, okay, good. And then I say to you, well, what about if you had a really deep, severe osteomyelitis? Oh, well, I'd have to give for eight or 10 weeks. Okay, good. What about if you were just mild disease, you caught it early, uh, mild dermatitis? You'd say, oh, I'd probably get away with, you know, he got some self-trauma, I'll give him seven to 10 days. Okay, good. Use exactly the same principles with, with your antiviral drugs. How severe is the disease? How entrenched is the disease? How resistant to treatment has the disease become? And then treat until they're better, then a bit longer, and then stop, don't taper. I have no idea why people turn their mind off and think about an antiviral drug as not being an antimicrobial drug. You've, you've got this dog that's doing superbly on 22 milligrams per kilogram of a cephalosporin for his dermatitis. And you say, you know what, we've got his, this dermatitis was really hard to control. I'm glad we've now got it under control at six weeks of 22 milligrams per kilogram twice a day. We'll go down now to 10 milligrams per kilogram twice a day. And you know, after a week or two, if that's going well, we'll go down to 10 milligrams every other day. You would never do that to an antibacterial drug. You should never do it to an antiviral drug. They either need it at the right dose or they don't need it. And that's why we don't taper, we stop cold. We go longer than we think they need it to make sure that they're well, and then we stop. And here's the really cool thing. If you give famcyclovir at 90 milligrams per kilogram twice a day, or at 40 milligrams per kilogram three times a day, then you, you do not need to use any topical antiviral drugs because this because it achieves adequate tear concentrations. Now let's look at how important that is. And from my opinion, why this drug when given at that dose is so effective and why when given at lower doses is sometimes effective. Here is the tear pencyclovir concentration of pencyclovir. So this is the how much pencyclovir we're getting into the tears and this is the time following the most recent oral famcyclovir dose. So I give the drug orally, I measure the tear concentrations, and I check how long they stay high. And this line is that line above which we would want it to be to slow down, not kill the virus. You can see that after one pill, I get, oh, sorry, after one dose, one appropriate dose, I get almost four hours, actually just over four hours of tear therapeutic concentrations. So you give that drug twice a day, you're getting eight hours of therapy bathing the cornea in pencyclovir. You give one drop of idoxuridine, you get five minutes, less with epiphora. Five minutes or I can give it five times a day, 25 minutes of therapy or eight hours of therapy with twice daily famcyclovir. You can see now why I think that famcyclovir given at the correct dose is the bomb for feline herpes virus. And by the way, it's getting into the conjunctiva in high concentrations and it's getting into any, um, any uh, other peripheral nerves, any other um, uh, dermatologic tissues, our nasal tissues, it's the bomb. 
Now, there's been some two recent studies, one in abstract form and one in already published, that show that compounding of this drug is very unreliable. Please do not get famcyclovir compounded. Uh, the drug concentrations are completely unreliable. It's incredibly unstable, and it is very, very bitter to the point where the cat won't eat it. Um, and then I see also that some compounding pharmacists are making it transdermal. Uh, that is absolutely ludicrous. When I call them and say, what, what are you doing? Why do you make this as a transdermal drug? They say, oh, well, we can make famcyclovir at a much lower concentration and just have them apply it to the inside of the ear because it bypasses hepatic metabolism. So, you know, we can give much lower doses. Remember what you know about cat drug metabolism in the liver and flip it on its head. This isn't a drug that requires metabolism to be degraded and excreted. Therefore, bypassing first pass metabolism is an advantage. This is a drug that needs metabolism to activate. So bypassing the liver metabolism makes it a waste of time. So don't give it transdermally. It has no effect. It can't have an effect because it's bypassing the liver metabolism. And in addition to giving the famcyclovir, always, always, always give topical hyaluronate. Topical hyaluronate is a mucinomimetic drug. It mimics the mucin. So Anvisions and Hypro is going to replace or mimic this mucus layer that ties the aqueous layer down onto the epithelium, the corneal and the conjunctal epithelium. And remember, their job is to repel water. So you've got to have that layer of binding. And it is that mucin layer is normally made by the conjunctival goblet cells. And this makes perfect sense if you think about it. This is a vicious cycle of disease. Let me explain. Let's just take, uh, let's just take a disease where the cat has reduced goblet cells. Goblet cells are these little magenta, shining purple uh, cells here. There's very few of them here in this epithelium. It is a diminished goblet cell density. Let's take this cat who, let's say, got a trauma and it scraped all of his goblet cells off. Doesn't matter how it started. Then he'll have reduced goblet cells. If he has reduced goblet cells, he'll have reduced mucin. And because the tears look after the conjunctiva, he'll have an inflamed conjunctiva because he's got bad tears. If he has an inflamed conjunctiva, then he's got reduced goblet cells. And so on around we go. Let's give him a tear film deficiency. Let's say this is a cat with a primary tear film deficiency. I don't know what they look like and whether they occur, but I bet they do. Then he's going to have conjunctivitis because he has dry eye. And if he has conjunctivitis, he's going to have poor goblet cells. And if he has poor goblet cells, he's going to have poor mucin and he's going to have a tear film deficiency. You see, it doesn't matter where we start. Let's give him squamous cell conjunctivitis, squamous cell carcinoma conjunctivitis. Then he's going to have reduced goblet cells, a poor tear film and worse conjunctivitis. See, it doesn't matter where he starts. This goes on as a vicious circle. And it turns out that herpes virus induces this in a way and in a chronicity that we never knew about. Uh, Dr. Lim did this research back in 2009. This horizontal line is the normal number of goblet cells found in a normal cat. And you can see that the cats that she started with started with normal goblet cell density. They were then infected with feline herpes virus. And not surprisingly, they got bad conjunctivitis and they dropped down to zero goblet cells. But then they got better. Cats that are infected with feline herpes virus get better over about 14 days. So by about day 14, they looked really good. They had no slit lamp discernible conjunctivitis. By 21 days, they looked absolutely normal. And at one month with a slit lamp, we definitely couldn't see anything wrong. But when we biopsied their conjunctiva, they still had marked depletion. Here's day 30 and here's normal. Look at how few goblet cells there is. And famcyclovir didn't fix this. So cats with conjunctivitis of any type have got to have an high pro. They've got to have a topical hyaluronate. And the reason they've got to have it 
is not just because of replacement therapy, there is now really good developing evidence to suggest that when you start to apply a hyaluronate onto an inflamed surface, not only does it just replace the mucin that wasn't there, like, you know, insulin for a diabetic, but it regenerates the goblet cells such that they start to take over their role again. So it stops the vicious cycle. You can now see why it doesn't matter to me what cause of conjunctivitis it is, non-infectious, infectious, herpes virus, chlamydia. Cats and dogs with conjunctivitis need anhypro. Cats with feline herpes virus also need not to be stressed. And I would strongly recommend that you do everything in your power to not use an e-collar in a cat with herpes virus. Cats aren't going to rupture their, do their eyes like dogs are. Cats are way too smart for that. They're gonna gently groom and lick. Treat, please try not to wear, uh, have e cats wear e-collars if you think ocular surface disease is their problem. And I think we need to start to pay more attention uh, to how we reduce cat stresses in those cats with chronic recurrent herpes virus. And this is, a, if you want to make a note of this website, this is a fantastic website that wasn't really set up for cat feline herpes virus, it was actually set up more for cat lower urinary tract disease. Um, uh, and this is a, Tony Buffington out of Ohio State has put together a really nice group of resources, one for pet owners, so that you can refer your cat owners here, and one for us, looking at ways that we can think about reducing cat stress. Well, Kathy, maybe we should stop for a moment there and do a little poll here. Let's ask the audience if we can. Um, and then, by the way, I'm going to wrap up in the next few minutes and take all of your final questions. But I wanted to ask you a question before you get to ask me a question. Uh, what about lysine? You guys can write A, B, or C in the question and answer box. Um, do you like lysine? Do you use it for cats with feline herpes virus? Uh, option A, if you want to write this. It's great. I give it to every cat that might need it. Option B, no, oh, it's okay. I doubt it hurts. Some cats actually seem to do well on it. Option C, it's voodoo medicine. I don't recommend it at all. I'd love to see the answers here. Kathy, we should have done an official poll. It's really fun, a little graph. I like this one too, because it's showing to be all over the board. You've got A's, oh, we've got E's, it. and we've got C's. Yep, so far anyway. Lots of A's, B's, and C's, did you say? I'd say probably predominantly B's and C's, but we've got some A's mixed in there too. Yeah, how about that, hey? Yeah, I think I am, um, I'm definitely a bee. I'm a fence sitter on this one. I don't think that it's dangerous. I know there was an article that came out saying that it should never be used in cats, that there's no evidence. I don't believe that. There, there, is, there is some good scientific evidence that in certain groups of cats it works. What we don't have is evidence of, uh, of its efficacy in the very cats we use it in. I'll show you what I mean in a moment here. Here's the story on, here's a quick summary of everything that's ever been published about lysine in cats. When you use it in vitro at really massive concentrations via arginine antagonism, so in other words, high lysine, low arginine, you can reduce viral replication. But when you put it in at physiologic concentrations, the sort of things that you'll get in a cat after you give them a lysine pill, you don't get any reduction in lice in viral replication. Uh, here's one of the here's one of the studies that did show effect. Uh, uh, again, a group of cats that I'm not seeing and not using lysine in, but a group that apparently it worked in. This was a placebo-controlled, double-masked, prospective trial. I mean, pretty much as good as it gets, right? In veterinary medicine, and this showed a decreased conjunctivitis in the. Um, uh, plus in the lysine treated cats. Um, in adult cats, again, a double mask study um, reduced shedding in the cats. They didn't have clinical signs. They were just asymptomatic shedders. So, so two studies supportive. Now we get to the clinical trials and this is where there's no support. When it was given only once daily and in what's a pretty challenging environment, right? A shelter. 
that's where, I mean, that's not treating Mrs. Jones's um, single cat. This is trying to control it in the worst nightmare. And it was only given once a day. Uh, they didn't see um, a positive effect. And in two studies in which we've given it to cats mixed in with the food, again, not in clinical trial as in client-owned animals, but a clinical trial as in a research population of cats that had endemic herpes virus and in a shelter, one study in a research population, one in a shelter. So again, pretty challenging circumstances. Not only was it not effective, it was counterproductive. The cats on the high lysine diet had worse signs and worse shedding than the cats on the regular lysine diet. So what do I do now? Quick summary on lysine. I do offer it. I offer it to clients and say, hey, you can try this if you like. Uh, we have no worries about safety and it might work. Some owners swear by it. I don't know whether you'll be one of those owners, but you won't know till you try. That's my approach with it. If I do, if they say, oh, I'd like to try that, I'm into that. Then I say, okay, it's got to be 500 milligrams twice a day because that's the only dose that's been shown in those two prospective trials to work. And it's got to be get a pill or a chew or a, it's got to be a bolus in the morning and a bolus in the evening. They can't just eat on the graze on the food. You can't, can't sprinkle it on the food and let them eat it throughout the day, for instance. It's got to be two big blips, one in the morning, one in the evening. And then forever, um, in inverted commas, if it works, great. Go ahead and, go ahead and give some more. Uh, keep giving it for, for life. Um, because we don't know of any safety issues at all. And I don't have a preference for whether they use the pastes or the chews or the powder or the pills, just so long as it's two boluses, one in the morning, one in the evening. Well, we've spent the, almost the whole time here talking about you go down that thing and you work out if it's herpes virus, and then we talked about all the antivirals. We spent the majority of the time on that because, by the way, that's where we have more choices. We don't need a choice with if we go down the chlamydial side. There is one excellent drug. Now, could there be a better one down the down the line? Sure, I'll be always looking. But at the moment, we don't need to think about topical teramycin or topical tetracycline. We don't think need to think about oral azithromycin. Both of those drugs, topical uh, tetracycline and oral azithromycin have been tested head to head with doxycycline and neither of them clears the bug from the patient and neither of them make the patient as um, objectively better as doxycycline does. So if you want the best clinical response and if you want the organism gone, then doxycycline is the only thing to give always with some hyaluronate because they've got conjunctivitis. They still need their goblet cells replenished, but they need the anti-infective as well. Now, here's the really cool thing. If you give five to 10 milligrams per kilogram orally once a day for four weeks, then not only will you improve, resolve the clinical signs of chlamydia, you'll cure the cat of the organism, you will clear the cat of the organism. And if you treat the in-contact cat, so Mrs. Jones has two cats, one of whom has chlamydia and is showing signs, the other of whom has chlamydia as well, you can be pretty sure of that, they can't live together and not share that organism, but may not be showing signs. If you treat the in-contact cats, then you will have cleared it from that household unless the cats go outdoors, unless Mr. and Mrs. Jones bring it back in on their uh, hands, fomites, unless they introduce a new cat. But you can resolve this disease, and that's why using it as a diagnostic test and not treating with both, disease, both at the same time is a good idea. Do remember that esophageal stricture is a risk of this. If you're in a part of the world where you have um, the commercially available oral suspension, I'm really jealous. Hello, Australia, hello, the UK. Really nice that you've got that. Um, and do use hyaluronate, uh, one drop, a few times a day, forever. Um, uh, this is the way to help continue to control that cat's conjunctivitis, of no matter the cause. Well, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to wrap up sort of where we started. 
and then ask if you have any questions. I'm going to tell you the sort of the, the algorithmic way I approach every case. Remember, I start by walking in, making sure they don't have a foreign body, making sure that they don't have um, eosinophilic disease, that they don't have um, 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 an entropion or, or lag ophthalmos, cranial nerve paralysis. There's a whole list of things that can cause conjunctivitis, but I go in there and make sure that there's no treatable other cause. Failing to find anything, I assume it's infectious. And I assume that it's likely chlamydia if I run down my little scale and my pebbles and the balance tilts towards those. And I decide it's likely feel and herpes virus if the balance tilts the other way. If I think it's likely herpes virus and if they've earned an antiviral, then they get famcyclovir 90 milligrams per kilogram twice a day. Topical hyaluronate for sure. They gotta go home with their bottle of Anhypro and that should be two, three, four times a day, whatever the owner can do. And it should be long-term as in possibly forever. Continue the famcyclovir till better, go a little bit more, stop cold, don't taper. If I think it's chlamydia, they get doxycycline, five to 10 milligrams per kilogram once a day. They get their Anhypro for sure. If they improve, then we go for four weeks. We treat the in-contact cats if that's reasonable and, and responsible. You know, how many are there and are we gonna be able to limit movement? And they stay on hyaluronic long-term. Now that's all dependent on them improving. We've already had the question, should I do both at once? No problems doing both at once, as long as you understand you won't have a diagnosis and you may increase, you will increase your chances of side effects. What about if there's no improvement? If there's no improvement, I go down one line, pending no improvement, I swap to the other line. So I do them, I do use both, but I use both in series, not in parallel. And notice that the central part of this is to maintain the ocular health during, because neither of the drugs, to the best of our knowledge, improves goblet cell deficiency, and to maintain the ocular health afterwards, maintaining a good tear film, maintaining good conjunctival um, protection and immunity, keep going with the anhypro, with the, keep going, going with the hyaluronate um, as, a, as a potentially lifelong therapy. Uh, this is, a, this is a, um, a, a photo sent to me by a client. This is a cat that did have chronic herpes virus disease. The owner is a very uh, intriguing lady who's intrigued by science. She's an engineer. Uh, she bought a copy of our book and then she sent me this photo of Doc uh, after Doc's eyes got a lot better. And she said uh, he seems to find it a uh, very restful book. A lot of people find the, find the book... Uh, easy to uh, go to sleep with. Um, but Kathy, that's that's all I have. And I think we're, you know, we've got at least 10 minutes or so for questions, if there are any. There are, there are quite a few and they're great questions. A lot of them based on therapy options, a couple still diagnostic ones that we might want to go back to too. Um, someone had asked uh, what drug you prefer to use to prevent symblepharon. Is there something that can do that? That's a really good question. And uh, for those who don't um, uh, know the basis of the question, symblepharon or fusion of conjunctiva to conjunctiva or fusion of conjunctiva to cornea, this is a, uh, a disease that occurs whenever those surfaces are ulcerated. And so herpes virus, of course, is really good at ulcerating one or both of those surfaces and allowing that fusion to occur. I will tell you that I do two things. One is that I have found that famcyclovir through its really rapid resolution of the ulcerative component of the herpes virus is amazing at limiting those symblepharon formation in the young kittens. And then the use of um, uh, either a topical hyaluronate or on this occasion, I'm more likely to use a topical uh, ointment. So a, a, a lubricant ointment something that is going to form a, a physical barrier between the two layers uh, to try to allow them to slide over each other and not fuse together. So I don't have a prevention, total prevention method, but by gosh, famcyclovir and a lubricant ointment reduce the frequency in my experience. Okay, great. 
Now, Dr. Lappin recently recommended using probiotics for cats. Um, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I well, first and foremost, I love Dr. Lappin. He was uh, one of my, he was my first ever feline herpes virus mentor. My first ever publication was during an in, my internship at Colorado. We've stayed really close friends. We love doing some uh, travel together and uh, we're looking forward to going back to that. And so uh, he and I have lectured together frequently and I've heard him very often speak about probiotics. And he did do uh, one study, which is um, uh, particularly related to uh, a, a probiotic and herpes virus. And it showed a minimal effect. There might've been some positive effect. And so I put it a bit in the lysine category. I put it right there with lysine saying, you know, we have no evidence this will do any harm. There's some evidence suggests that it might help in some cats. So I say, have at it. Um, I really hope yours is one of the cats that it will help. I think it's one of these things where like lysine should just set the expectations about right. Famcyclovir, sure, we can probably really revolutionize your cat's care. Probiotics, lysine, it might help. And that's sort of my summary. Okay, great. Have you ever used topical ophthalmic pencyclovir? So actually applying it directly to the eye. If so, what's yeah. your favorite? Yeah, this is where we need to go. Um, uh, I, there's some really wonderful early work uh, um, coming out of Israel. Um, uh, um, Oren Pierre and Ron Offrey at the Hebrew University have got some really, really promising initial information. And it makes perfect sense, right? Penzyclovir wouldn't need any conversion. We know it's effective. If it's well tolerated by the ocular surface, then I would say bring it on. At best of my knowledge, at least in the US uh, and nowhere else that I've seen, is it available yet as a commercial ophthalmic? If it is available in your area as a commercial ophthalmic, not dermatologic, then go ahead and use it. It would be virologically, it would make perfect sense. And if it's been licensed for the use on a human eye, then I don't foresee any problem with it being used on a cat eye. Um, having said that, no, I have no personal experience, but the experience coming out of Israel is really promising. Great, thank you. Lots of questions on the, the minimum age for famcyclovir in kittens um, in terms of efficacy, um, any pediatric dose adjustment, how to get a safe dose into those young kittens, given how difficult it is to manipulate those really large pills um, and the concerns with compounding efficacy and bitterness. Yeah, all really good questions. And for me, this is the patient that probably benefits the most from famcyclovir. Uh, we're just coming up now to close to 400 kittens treated in a clinical trial with famcyclovir. And by kittens, I mean bottle-fed babies of just a few days age, eyes not yet open, uh, right through to multiple months where people become less concerned. Um, there is one publication uh, already, if you feel like you need um, um, peer-reviewed publication to rely on and defend your position um, in JAVA by Thomasy and others, and that showed that uh, there, uh, there was no minimum age that they could determine that it was safe, and in fact, when they compared um, potential side effects in uh, three populations, they took that group of cats that they used it in, they said, well, here's the juveniles, here's the adults, and here's the geriatrics, um, and they had cutoff points that I don't quite recall, but you, you can guess what they might have been or read the JABMA article. And actually, the, the juveniles had the lowest side effect rate. Side effects tend to be GI related and are rapidly reversible when stopping the drug. So I actually think that probably one of the safest populations to use it in is the young kitten. Now, how do you get that dose? We still give them 90, 90 milligrams per kilogram. It's a tiny actual dose. And what we do uh, is take a tablet, grind it up, weigh it, and put it into a little gel capsule or mix it with um, um, a water and squirt it down straight away. Not mix it up and send it home with the client as a suspension, too unstable. The problem with squirting it down as a um, suspension is that it is phenomenally bitter. So, okay, as best we know, to mix it with water and, and um, orally infuse immediately, not okay to store mixed up with water. 
uh, best of all to grind up a pill, put it into a little gel cap and have the clients give gel caps. Um, and that overcomes the bitterness problem and the stability problem. One thing with young kittens, which we've learned, of course, you guys already knew, uh, when they do well, they grow fast. Um, the dose needs to change sometimes weekly, sometimes twice weekly. You need to change that um, gel cap size. No concerns giving in young kittens. Any concerns with the doxycycline with the young kittens? Yeah, I, I know the concern historically has been teeth um, discoloration. Um, our internal medicine specialists tell me not to worry about that with doxycycline. It's certainly the case with tetracycline, uh, oxytetracycline, for instance. But with doxycycline, um, my, our um, internal medicine specialists tell me not to worry about that. And so, no, uh, in that study I mentioned of the 400 cats, um, 400 tiny little baby kittens, um, the control group is getting doxycycline. So uh, we have no concerns with that. Okay. Um, do you ever use contact lenses for corneal ulcers associated with um, feline herpes virus? Um, and can you use something like anti Anhypro with contact lenses? Yeah, great question. I do love contact lenses for dogs and cats. I love them because uh, they improve comfort. They're probably, when you have an ulcerated cornea, they're probably one of the most um, wonderful treatments. Um, and Vision has a superb set of contact lenses for dogs and cats. Um, nice range of sizes, fit well. Um, can you use a drug such as Anhypro, or, or perhaps I can expand that to any ophthalmic solution um, with the contact lens on? And yes, you can. Um, those contact lenses uh, float on a little meniscus of tears and a solution will get under and maybe even through the lens uh, fairly well, um, we think. The reason I say we think is that, let me say, uh, let me give you an example. If you put a drop of fluorescein on a cat or a dog with a contact lens, that whole meniscus underneath the lens, that, that meniscus of tears turns bright green. So we know it's tracked underneath there. Uh, again, Ron Offrey's group in Israel, though, have taken uh, two different drugs. I think they took latanoprost, a glaucoma drug, and tropicamide, a pupil dilating drug. And they found that when they put them onto a dog eye with a contact lens, they got a variable result, suggesting that maybe the lens was adsorbing some of the drug or that the drug wasn't getting through or getting under. So not sure that we can say for sure that everything works, but... Um, Certainly, um, uh, I go ahead with ophthalmic solutions, but not ointments when I have a contact lens. Love um, uh, contact lenses. Uh, make sure you have a look at Anvision's range, a tremendous range of sizes for dogs and cats. Great. And then a lot of questions about dry eye. How often do you find low tear production in cats after herpes virus infection? And in those situations, in addition to something like Anhypro, application, do you use immunomodulators like tacrolimus or topical cyclosporin? Yeah, now this one we could do another 45 minutes on. So you're gonna to have to rein me in here, Dr. Good. You know okay. my fascination. Love with... reining you in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's your job. It should, it, 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 seven days a week, basically at Davis, hey? So um, I have a fascination with cat tears and I credit Lionel Seabag, uh, one of our previous residents. Uh, some of you may have known him at Iowa, now at, at Israel with Ron. Um, Lionel um, really got me interested in cat tears because I was of the opinion that there's no point doing a shamas in cats because they're so unreliable. And Lionel took a group of 120 normal cats and proved that you could absolutely detect a reference range and he's got the reference range for cats and should be greater than nine. And uh, no cat was great, was less than seven. We used to think that cats with zero were normal. That is to say, they could temporarily shut down their tears with sympathetic drive. Well, Lionel took that theory and threw that away too. He took cats and gave them some sympathetic drive. Can you believe this? Um, uh, all approved, of course, by an animal care and use uh, protocol, but he took a Sherma tear test in a quiet room and then in a room with a tape recording of a dog barking. 
And would you believe that stress um, uh, doesn't affect, well, it uh, doesn't minimize tears. In fact, in some of the cats, they actually had uh, higher tears with stress. So all that, that's a long way of saying those old theories, no point taking the Shermers in cats, that's wrong. We don't know the reference range in cats, that's wrong. It's greater than nine and it's never less than seven. And um, well, stress will make them temporarily shut it down. No, that's wrong as well. So with all that information, I am now really interested in measuring Shermers and understanding Shermers in cats. Uh, Lionel and I now have a couple of publications looking at herpes virus and its effect on tears and encourage you to have a look at those. One of them's uh, in Frontiers in Veterinary Science and it's um, open access. Um, we do think that uh, herpes virus affects tearing and the way we think it does so is of course in the acute phase it's irritating it makes you tear more but in a cat that's had chronic herpes virus chronic transmission up and down the trigeminal nerve then we get some probably some neurotrophic keratitis some destruction of cranial nerve 5 function some reduction therefore in sensitivity of the cornea some reduction therefore in reflex tearing some reduction in basal tearing and so I do think that herpes virus may be a cause of chronic dry eye in some cats. Here's the problem. The ones that we've tested, and there's only been half a dozen, are not responsive to the immunomodulators. Not surprisingly, they don't have a lymphocytic, plasmacytic infiltrate of their lacrimal gland. Um, now, those drugs, the cyclosporine in particular, is, I know, directly lacrimogenic. That is to say it should stimulate tear production uh, even in the absence of immune media infiltration, it doesn't seem to give the kick that we like those cats to have. By the way, he's, I'll, I'll, so I'm going to finish up by saying on that one, finish up that question by saying, no, we don't have a good treatment when they have nerve damage, dry eye. But here's a way to prove that they have it. And this is so simple, so fantastic, and something which we need to all add to our armamentarium. It's, the problem is it's diagnostic only. We'd, we still have no therapy once we discover this. And again, I credit Lionel, this has been in the human literature for years. He discovered it, tried it in cats. So we do a Schirmer tear test that is stimulated by something other than the frictional irritation of the tear test on the cornea. If they have no cranial, if they have reduced cranial nerve fire, function on their face and on their cornea, then the Schirmer tear test isn't going to stimulate reflex tearing. So you do that Schirmer tear test, and then you do a second Schirmer tear test at least five, 10 minutes later, let them regenerate their, um, their tear film, this time holding a cotton uh, ball soaked in 70% alcohol in front of their nose, not touching their nose, but so that they get the olfactory stimulation and look at the percentage increase in tearing between the normal eye and the affected eye. By the way, that, that dry eye, that feline herpes virus neurotrophic dry eye, almost always unilateral. And you will see a dramatic percentage increase in the neurotrophic dry eye, and you won't see a dramatic percentage increase. So in other words, we're saying you can stimulate tears. This tear gland will make tears. That's why cyclosporin doesn't work. It just doesn't know to make tears because the afferent pathway is damaged. Let's re-stimulate a different afferent pathway. Let's stimulate olfactory nerve. Fascinating test, really interesting way of diagnosing dry eye in cats and written up in our study if you want to read more about it. <clears throat> okay, what about the use of adjunctive interf uh, interferon in cats with uh, feline herpes virus? Yeah, I'd love to. I, I want to thank the um, our questioner from Europe. Um, it's almost certainly a European who has asked the question because you have access to much better and probably broader range, I should say broader and probably better range of interferons than we do in the US. Uh, we have only interferon alpha here, and I'm not even sure we have that now. That's the one we've only ever one we've had. You have interferon omega there, and, um, and it's a feline recombinant, whereas we have a human recombinant alpha. A um, couple of things. There's been a huge range of studies, none of which has shown, not one of which has shown in a placebo controlled manner that interferon helps in feeling herpes virus. And yet it should. So 
I don't use it because we don't have access to a feline, feline recombinant. We don't have access to omega. And I don't use it because there's no peer-reviewed evidence that I'm aware of that shows that it works. The one really good double mask prospective placebo-controlled study showed no effect. However, there's all sorts of ways it's been given, not all of which have been studied effectively. Mega doses subcutaneously, um, mega doses orally, lots of topical doses. I put it into the probiotic lysine thing, probably not likely to do much harm, may help in some. If you're a believer and if you've got a client who's a believer, go for it. This is a disease that we need all the help we can get on. I don't have personal confidence or experience with it. Okay, and um, versus our $300 for topical again, cyclovir here in the US, um, many have chimed in in the UK that it's about 50 to 60 pounds, which is what, roughly about 70 to $80? 70 or $80, yeah. Okay, and, so and, and they, and in, yep. Oh, and they in Europe, love maybe it. only 50. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say they love it. They said they love it. Yeah, and that's why I quoted the European experience on continental Europe as little as 15 euros. And uh, I always take an empty suitcase over and bring one back. No, I don't. Um, but I'm often tempted to pay for the trip. Um, and so the Europeans, um, continental Europe, Britain, have great experience with this. I really wish that they would publish their experience. We're desperate to have some peer-reviewed evidence of GAN cyclovir. So keep using it. But um, keep using it in a way that'll allow you to record it as a clinical trial and tell us about it. Because they were asking whether you would choose famcyclovir over gangcyclovir or vice versa, if you had the ability yeah. to. Yes, I would. I would still choose famcyclovir based on first principles. Remember, I haven't had the experience you've had of using it. You've got the, I understand it's a complex question. You've got costs, you've got side effects, you've got can the owner pill the cat? You've got, can the owner apply a gel to the cat? I understand that this is not a one size fits all and that each of us would answer, each of our clients would answer this question differently. We'd answer this question differently for every client, for every patient. But here on balance is why if all things are equal, famcyclovir would be the preferred drug. It's because it's going to achieve eight hours of pentencyclovir concentration in the tears and it's going to achieve longer tissue concentrations in the conjunctiva, possibly getting to nerves and definitely getting to other mucosal and dermatologic surfaces. Um, Zergan is going to get to the eye for a short amount of time, not the mouth, not the nose, not into the conjunctiva, not for long. So on first principles, famcyclovir better than any topical drug. For individual patients, absolutely can hear the arguments for one over the other. And then how often do you recommend the, um, the topical um, hyaluronate-based products like Anhypro um, and preservative, preservative-free? The, the joy of Anhypro is it's preservative-free. Yeah, thank you. Great questions. There is a wide variety of the hyaluronates and I love the, the non-preserved versions. Um, Preservatives, as particularly when we're going to talking about a lifelong or a multiple times a day therapy, and in a sick eye, preservatives are, are toxins, um, and so uh, they're just acceptable toxins. So um, uh, I um, I think that if we, if we're to borrow from human use, which is just to use it to the level of comfort, you know, what makes you feel good, people are sometimes putting it in, you know, often putting in multiple times a day, every few hours. And so I think if we're using non-preserved, it's very hard to th think of a situation where you could overuse this drug. You could wear the client out, you could stress the cat. I get all of that stuff, but at a medical level, not at a socio-medical level, then I think that you know um, whatever the client can reasonably achieve three, four times a day, would be wonderful. And there's not as if there's a, uh, this isn't like one of our antimicrobials where we have a, a set point below which we're actually causing damage. On this occasion, I think anything's a bonus. Okay, great. Um, and then Khaleesi virus, what's your thought on Khaleesi virus as a potential component with these chronic conjunctivitis cats? 
Yeah, I think Khaleesi virus definitely causes conjunctivitis. Um, but I think it causes conjunctivitis most commonly and most likely as a, I'm a sick cat with my whole head on fire. And oh, by the way, my conjunctiva is part of that. Whereas I see herpes virus doing that certainly exactly the same way in the young kitten approach. But then later in life, I see uh, herpes virus as just an ocular just a dermatologic, just a nasal pathogen, depending on the cat. So eye disease only, Khaleesi, probably not very common. Eye disease is part of an ocular syndrome, Khaleesi, absolutely, sorry, part of a large upper respiratory system um, syndrome, absolutely Khaleesi. Um, the, moving on to, I don't think part of that question, but something I want to make clear, Khaleesi is an RNA virus. And so we would not expect uh, any of the antiviral drugs I just finished talking about to have any effect against Khaleesi virus. Khaleesi, an RNA virus, herpes virus, a DNA virus, and these, all of these antiviral drugs targeting the DNA, which is why they're dangerous but it's why they're acceptably dangerous in the, with the modifications that I talked about. Great, and then I think we can wrap it up with just a question with regards to famcyclovir. There were several with regards to how long do you, I know it's kind of an open-ended question, as to how long you might expect in the improvement to be seen. So if you're seeing the patient initially, you're dispensing it, how many days, weeks do you prescribe that famcyclovir Fam cyclovir four, and then have them come in maybe for a follow up visit. Yeah, and, and you're right to predict, Kathy. That is going to be highly variable on the syndrome. But let's take two common syndromes, almost at each end of the spectrum. Let's take the young kitten. So we're seeing the young kitten who has just terrible inflamed bilateral um, ocular disease bilateral, um, terrible respiratory disease, maybe even life-threatening because they're not eating well, then this is a cat that would do extraordinarily well in my experience, as I say, with the 400 we've just finished treating, um, will do extraordinarily well with maybe just as little as a week, maximum of 10 to 14 days of therapy. They will be so well that you'll think it'll be clear to you to stop. Then we get at the other end of the spectrum, for instance, the cat with just the chronic recurrent conjunctivitis that nothing really helps on. That's a cat where sometimes the, the famcyclovir is going to be helpful. They may take longer to get right. They've got much more entrenched disease. Don't forget to give them the hyaluronate at the same time because the famcyclovir isn't treating their other morphologic changes. It's only treating the virologic changes. Um, and so that might be a cat that needs four, five, six weeks of therapy until he looks really good. Go for another one or two weeks because it took you four to six weeks to get him right. Then stop cold and tell the owner, keep going with the hyaluronate. That's the way we'll try to reduce the number of recurrences. And then very preemptively and early, if he starts to show signs, start him up again on famcyclovir, hoping that you only need to go maybe a week the next time. So sort of pulse therapy later on in those recurrent cats, training owners to come in as early as possible. So two ends of the spectrum, by the way, with almost everything in between as well, it just has to be tailored to the individual patient. Okay, I think that really covers a lot of these questions here. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really have enjoyed it. Kathy, thank you for your moderation. Everyone around the globe, stay safe. Thank you for your um, uh, help. And Anne Vision, thank you so much for sponsoring this uh, at this distance for all of us. Kathy, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was fantastic. Thanks to everybody for attending. Great time. All right. Bye for now, everybody. Thank you.